If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host. I'm the director of Christian Answers. And joining me in this program is my colleague in the ministry, Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here, Steve. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Steve is our director of research with Christian Answers. And uh, this particular series that we've been doing, particularly if you've been watching over the past few weeks, is on the subject of Islam, the Muslim religion. And we're trying to answer the question through this series, which is very analytical, in detail of the Islamic religion, we're trying to answer the question, can believing the Muslim religion send someone to hell? I mean, this is a question a lot of people don't stop and think about. It, a lot of people think you can just believe anything you want and you'll be all right with God. But uh, the, the key here is, can you just believe Islam and be all right with God and not go to hell? Can the Muslim religion send someone to hell? That's the question. And we're going to come, come at that question not only from a detailed analysis of uh, Islamic material, but from the biblical perspective. But it's, because after all, when you really think about it, where does the whole concept of hell come from? Does it come from uh, some... Uh, Navajo Indian tribe that had a belief about it or some unknown Chinese group that uh, had a religious thought about it. No, the concept of hell comes from the Bible and even the Quran, the Islamic sources will admit that. It's a biblical term. So when we think of the concept of hell, we have to think of uh, what does the Bible say in relation to it? So we're going to look at that question and uh, as we answer that question, we find ourselves already in show number seven. This is show number seven in this Islam series, each show being about an hour long. And we're going to spend some time today asking the question about the changes in the Quran. The Quran is the Bible, you might say, of Islam. Mm -hmm. And so the question we want to ask is, is the Quran today the same as the original Quran? A lot of people think, well, and the arguments I hear from Muslims is, well, you can't trust the Bible. It's been changed and, and messed up and corrupted, and, and it's not dependable anymore. Uh, and we always hear attacks against the Bible. But uh, why don't we turn that question around and ask ourselves, well, what about the Quran? Mm -hmm. Has the Quran been changed and tampered and corrupted and messed up? You know, why believe it? Because it's so changed up and messed up. Who even wants to bother with it? Does anyone ask that question? Well, we're going to take a look at that and tie it in with the overall uh, question we ask about uh, going to hell, as we mentioned before. Okay, Steve, uh, we've got a chart up here on the, on the, on the screen, and uh, this is basically an overview of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, right. You want wait, to run wait. through those just briefly? Well, I thought we'd look at this chronologically. Uh, we'd say, well, what about God's word prior to the Quran? Has it been corrupted or not? What does the Bible say? What does the Quran say? Uh, we're going to not talk about the evidence of that until the end, though. Then what about uh, verses from the Quran that were abrogated or canceled in the lifetime of Muhammad? Then we'll talk about changes after Muhammad. Then we'll talk about a major change where the Caliph Uthman uh, decided the, the Quran needed standardizing and where he put different verses and, and had verses that are in and out different places. And then we're going to talk about the Quran today, the, how it differs from uh, Uthman's standardized Quran. And then and then we're going to contrast that briefly with the reliability of the Old Testament and then with the reliability of the New Testament. So we got a lot on our plate today. Outstanding, outstanding. Hopefully we'll be able to get through it all in the time allotted us here. 
but uh, we'll just get right into it then and begin with this first uh, graphic that we're seeing on our screen. Steve, take it away. Okay. Uh, a couple of main points looking at the Quran, uh, which uh, Muslims would say you know, was written by the same God who originally gave the message to Moses and Jesus and other people in the Old Testament. But Allah is claimed to be the same God as, Christian, as, as Christians and Jews. Uh, and the uh, support for that is Surah 2946. Uh, the, the Bible for Christians and Jews was not only for them, it was to be made known to all mankind according to Surah 3, 187. And after that, the context is a criticism of at least the Jews, I don't know about the Christians, but at least a criticism of the people of the book uh, for failing to make it known to all mankind. So it was supposed to be known to all mankind. And then uh, Surah 4, 150 to 151, uh, basically says, don't selectively believe just some of God's messengers. You can't say, I believe this and I reject this. Is you have to believe all of God's messengers. So you can't just go with Abraham and leave out Jesus. Right. Something like that. Or, 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 uh, right. And, and actually, as Christians, we would agree with this particular concept, but the issue here was, is Muhammad a messenger of God? If he's not a messenger of God, then we don't have to believe him. If he was a messenger of the true God, then we would need to believe him. Okay? Now, the uh, Muhammad uh, alleged uh, it, that the Quran confirmed what the people of the book, that is Christians and Jews, already had in Surah 447. And let me go ahead and read that one. It says, O ye people of the book, believe in what we now we have now revealed, now in parentheses, confirming what was already with you, before we change the face of, and fame of some of you beyond all recognition. So the Christians and Jews here were told to confirm uh, what was now revealed through Muhammad by, I guess, confirmed by looking at the scriptures they already had. Okay, And then finally, um, in Isaiah 59 in the Bible, it says, God promised that his word would not depart from the mouths of the Jews. And let me go ahead and read that one. Uh, Isaiah 59, 21 in the NIV. As for me, this is my covenant with him, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth, or from the mouths of your children, or from the mouths of their descendants, from this time on and forever, says the Lord. Now given all this, there's one verse in the Quran that I think is especially remarkable, and two very similar right after it. In Surah 546, and it says, And in there, meaning the prophet's footsteps, we sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah, important phrase there, that had come before him, we sent him the gospel, another important phrase. Therein was guidance and light, and confirmation of the Torah that had come before him, a guidance and admonition to those who fear Allah. Okay, so the Torah was not corrupt in Jesus' time, or else the Quran is wrong, because Jesus confirmed the Torah that had come before him. Okay? Now, uh, in verse uh, Surah 547, right after this, it says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein, meaning the Torah and the gospel. If the people of the gospel are to judge by what God revealed in the Torah and the gospel, then they had to have the Torah and the gospel, at least in Jesus' time. Okay. Then Surah 548 says, To thee, meaning people of the book, we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it, and guarding it in safety. Okay, that's a very, even though it's in the Quran, that's a very biblical concept, that, that God guarded the, the gospel and the Torah in safety. Okay? So judge between them by what Allah hath revealed, and follow not their vain desires, diverging from the truth that had come to thee. So either God guarded the scriptures, the Torah and the Old Testament, or the Quran is wrong. Though I don't believe in the Quran, I do believe in this particular point that he did guard the Old Testament. Okay, so God gave his word, and God Almighty has the power to guard his word. Now, there are other places in the Quran that talk about uh, Jews not, and maybe Christians not following their scriptures or, or trying to corrupt their scriptures, and it doesn't say that, 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 that all scripture was corrupted. It just said that, that, that they tried to do that. Just like today, uh, you have Jehovah's Witnesses and others that have uh, maybe copies of the um, you know, uh, of the Bible where they put changes in, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, that the real copies of the Bible, um, you know, 
ha- haven't been preserved. Or like you got groups like the Jesus Seminar that say, "Oh, well, Jesus didn't say this, and he said that," and they right. just decide, and they and people come out with their own versions and 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 uh, copies of the Bible, and they may take things out, put things in. Right. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about historical manuscripts going back in time right. to the times of the apostles. Right. Right. So, so so to put this in terms, Muslims could relate to if somebody made up a bunch of junk and they use half verses in the Quran and they use half their own stuff okay that and they and they said this was the Quran that would be a false statement but that would do nothing to prove the Quran true or false and that would do nothing to say well is, is the Quran that we have today uh, you know the, the same as before that would not even uh, affect the question because we would know that that would be corrupt and, 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 and that we could look at the ground. Right, right. So if people have done that with the Bible, um, that doesn't mean that we don't still have the, the Bible. Yeah, the original Bible. The original, before right. people tried to mess it up and all that right, kind of right, stuff. Right, right, right. But there hasn't really been a lot of messing up. I mean, exactly. And, and, we'll and, get into that. and if there is a little, we know what, where it is and what they were doing. Right. Uh, okay. Well, we're looking at the question of the, the, the Quran, the Muslim Bible, you might say, and what they believe to be Allah's word. Uh, the attacks Muslims always make against Christians and stuff because they Muslims realize that Christianity is a different religion than Islam is, and the God that the two religions are, are serving is a different God. Muslims are worshiping a different God than the Christians are because Christians true Christians, Bible-believing Christians, believe that Jesus is God, mm-hmm. but a Muslim would never accept that. He would deny that Jesus is God and uh, throw out the concept of the, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we already know that we're dealing with two separate and distinct religions that have nothing to do with each other as far as the nature of God. And they are, so the Muslims realizing this know they have to attack the Bible to discredit it because the Bible is teaching a different God than they believe in. And so they're always saying the Bible's changed and messed up. And now we want to look at the question, what about the what about the Quran? Okay. I mean, you know, they can throw stones and sticks and everything at the Bible, but what about can someone turn around and say, Well, what about your book? Mm-hmm. Uh now you mentioned before the abrogated verses. All right. Let's uh, let's talk about that. All right. Uh, in the Bukhari Hadith, uh, volume 5, uh, number 416, it says, Then Allah revealed to us a verse that was among the canceled ones later on. Now, he's talking about verses that are Muhammad's word that would be in the Quran. Uh, it, uh, that would be the normal interpretation. There are some Muslims who would try to say that, well, when it talks about abrogation, it's really talking about abrogation, abrogating verses in the Bible or, or, or something like that. But this, but this next uh, quote from Bukhari shows that that's wrong. It says, narrated Anas bin Malik. There was revealed about those who were killed at Bur Mauna, a uh, Quranic verse we used to recite, but it was canceled later on. The verse was, Inform our people that we have met our Lord. He is pleased with us and has made us pleased. Uh, this is volume 4, number 69. Okay. So, uh, so this, because it was Bir Mauna, uh, that shows this isn't talking about a verse in the Bible. This is talking about a verse among the Arabs with the Quran, and this was one that was canceled. Okay, so there were verses canceled in the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. And this is stuff you're not making up. This is in the Hadith. Right. That 85% of the Muslim world, roughly, the Sunnis, yeah. roughly, approximately would recognize as being authoritative. Mm-hmm. Right there in Hadith. Okay, we've got, uh, according to the chart here, we've got other references. Uh, right. Uh, volume 4, number 57. Uh, volume 4, number 299. Volume 5, number 416. And Volume 5, number 421. And they all repeat ba- basically the same thing, but kind of multiple attestation inside the Bukhari Hadith. So, so here they're actually admitting that there's something that was from the Prophet and even recited by Muslim followers. Mm-hmm. And then later it's abrogated and taken away. Right. Like, I mean, that, that's, that's dangerous, I think, if you really think about it. If you can, if, if the prophets, what, what, do we know from these uh, hadiths if the prophet was alive at the time? Or uh, was this after his death? Or do we have a time uh, period my, on what my, uh, Mine, uh, my understanding is that he would be alive at the time. I could be mistaken about that. 
but but certainly if it, he wasn't alive at the time, it was very short. It would be very shortly at, after his death. Do you think there's any examples where he might have been alive and then took something back? Oh, very definitely. In, in fact, one of the most in interesting places um, is in uh, uh, Surah 53. Okay, now we're, the people at home are looking at the next chart. The uh, satanic verses? Right. Now, probably everybody has heard the name Satanic Verses as a modern book title by Salman Rushdie. And while, and this is actually something different. I haven't read the book by, uh, uh, by Rushdie, but, but all he did was he got the title from something that was studied a lot by Muslims in the past called the Satanic Verses. And it's actually one verse and then changes it in, in maybe the following verses to, to match or not match. Uh, but, uh, but in Surah 53, 19 through 20, in the original Quran, as well as today, it says, Have ye thought upon Alat and Al Uzzah and, and Manat, the third, the other? Now, these three were known to be goddesses, according to the Bukhari Dis, of the Koresh, uh, goddesses of their uh, idol god named Allah. Okay? Now, what was said after that is originally, according to some sources, it says, these are exalted ones. The actual Arabic word that I believe is cranes or like high flying birds, but that's a, a metaphor for like um, beings between God and people. And it says, these are exalted ones or intermediaries whose intercession is to be hoped for. Okay, that's what it uh, said originally. And then, but if you look in the Quran today, it does not say that part. Instead, it says, are yours the males and his the females? That indeed were an unfair division. Now, the explanation of, the, of this modern part is saying, well, uh, if the Arab, Arabs always want to have sons instead of daughters, and you're saying that uh, Allah had only daughters, well, that's kind of unfair. Why didn't Allah have sons? Which, that's kind of another topic about, you know, equality of men and women for another time. But, but, but the, you have this original phrase, which is idolatrous, that we should hope for the intercession of these goddesses versus what's today. So they've actually taken that verse that was from Muhammad mm -hmm. out and put this other verse in its place. No, no, it's not they did it, it's that Muhammad himself did Mah Okay, that's a key point. Yeah. And I'm glad I made that mistake because mm -hmm. there might have been other people that made that mistake. That what you're saying is Muhammad did this himself. Right. And it's, it's attested to from Islamic sources. Right. So this isn't something you made up. Right. Oh, not at all. And it's kind of interesting to read how Allah could even have abrogated verses. Uh, you can look in Surahs 1339, uh, 16101, and 2106. Okay. Now, uh, what do Muslims say about this? Well, many Muslims actually are probably un unaware of this. Uh, some of the ones who are aware of this, they would say, well, um, that was just a fabrication from later, or they were never really in there, or something like that. And so they ask us, what's the evidence that it was in there? That's uh, a, a fair question. And we have four different lines of evidence. All right, first of all, um, the, one of Islam's foremost scholars was named Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, or you can just remember him as al-Tabari. And he died in 923 AD. And he wrote about the Satanic Verses and about the uh, context uh, uh, of it, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Also, Al-Wahidi, he wrote the Azbab al-Nazul, which had a uh, discussion of the Satanic Verses and said it was originally in there. Uh, Ibn Sa'd, he, he also wrote about it, but he, all these four are sort of independent, except that Ibn Sa'd, he was definitely aware of Al-Wahidi's work. Okay, and, uh, and then uh, you have Ibn Ishaq, who wrote the Sirat Rasulallah, uh, and he talked about that too. Now, uh, some Muslims would say, well, why don't we see anything about this in the Bukhari Hadith? Why don't we see anything about this in the Quran? Well, you do see uh, maybe some implied stuff in there, not outright, but implied. Uh, Bukhari, and let me just say something. Bukhari, he died 870 AD. He's sort of in the general time frame as these other guys. Uh, people in uh, pay fines or are accused of being criminals or even lose their lives because of stuff that is in the Bukhari Hadith, because, because it's a, a Sharia, it's Islamic law in Sunni Muslim countries. And so if something is in the Bukhari once, then that's authoritative for many Sunni Muslims. All right, but we have four different direct sources that talk about this from the same time period. Period. Plus, we have some implications we'll get into in Bukhari and the Quran itself. Okay, in in uh, in Bukhari, uh, it's uh, it says that when Muhammad delivered the Star Surah, which is the name of Surah 53, it says that pagans as well as Muslims bowed. Now, how did Muhammad perform that trick? How did Muhammad? Uh, deliver the Quran, and he got pagans to bow and agree it was great and good as well as Muslims. Well, 
one way of doing that would have been to put the satanic verses in. Okay. Another thing which is uh, very interesting is um, uh, there's talk about the temptations uh, that a prophet, any prophet of God has for Satan's interjections. So, and this is in Surah 53, 19 through 26. There's discussion about this in 1773 through 95. And I have a, a website reference, um, www.answering-islam.org, and then slash Quran, slash miracles, uh, slash satanic verses.htm to see more information on this. And actually, kind of, you can see both sides, Muslims as, as is. Yeah, the people looking at this chart, they can see it right there and, and write that down. And, uh, you know, if you're on the internet, go check it out. It's all right there. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, important verse is in Surah 2252. Now, this is in Yusuf Ali's translation. And remember, the words in parentheses um, are what Yusuf Ali is saying he added. It wasn't in the Arabic, but he added to make it uh, uh, more plain meaning. And I, mean, I don't have a great problem with what he added, but I'll go ahead and read this. Never did we send an apostle or a prophet before thee, but when he framed a desire, Satan threw some vanity into his desire. But God will cancel anything vain that Satan throws in. And God will confirm and establish his signs. All right, dot, dot, dot. So it's saying that never did we send an apostle or a prophet or anything in that, um, that, but that whenever he was going to do something, Satan tried to interject, uh, try to throw something in. But he said that if Satan did throw something in, uh, that God would handle it, Allah would handle that by basically canceling it and taking it out. So that's where you get this idea of abrogation. Right, from the Quran itself. And, and I'll, I'll add today's Quran. And so here we've got the prophet himself making mistakes and then taking it back out at, while he's still alive. Well, wait, wait, yes, and, and, and according to the, the four Muslim uh, uh, scholars who, who wrote about this, is uh, basically the, uh, when Muhammad was speaking, uh, these verses kind of came out, this part came out, and everybody bowed, and everybody said that was great, and, and then the, uh, Jibril, which is Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, came and spoke to Muhammad and said, you know, what have you said, you know, this wasn't what it was, and it was supposed to be this. Mm -hmm. And so it was corrected, you know, in the lifetime of Muhammad, not afterwards. But it's like, you know, how could a how could a prophet of God start saying idolatrous stuff? Um, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, if Satan could inspire him, then what else could Satan touch? Exactly, because uh, when we read the biblical accounts of Christ, he was tempted in every way by the devil, particularly in Luke mm -hmm. chapter four, Matthew chapter four. Uh, devil threw everything he had at him, and he couldn't touch him. <laughs> right. Wait, you couldn't Jesus, touch Jesus. Jesus was without sin. Now, people can sin by their actions. They can sin by what they fail to do. They can sin by their words. And telling people that you should hope to, uh, for the intercession of idols sounds to me like a sin in words. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, he, and he's declaring it in the name of Allah. Right. <laughs> Which makes it even a bigger sin. Right. Because then, uh, apparently from the Hadith, they're, they're going ahead and reciting verses and doing things. And then later, they have to stop it because it turns out it's abrogated. Yeah. So yeah. one moment it's true, and the next moment it's false. So speaking in the name of Allah uh, about the intercession of idols. And I think it even says in the, in the Old Testament, which uh, the Quran and Muhammad give credence to, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 18, you know, if a man says something in the name of God and it doesn't come to pass, you shouldn't you shouldn't pay any attention to them. Right. You shouldn't uh, you shouldn't hold them in esteem. And in fact, uh, <laughs> the, the biblical command for false prophets, especially if they spoke in the name of God and they led people after other gods mm -hmm. or, or did things of this nature, spoke things that were not true in the name of God, they were to be stoned. Right. In Old Testament times. And yeah. so Muhammad would qualify for stoning under the law of Moses, mm -hmm. uh, just for these things. So obviously, as we've mentioned before, Islam has a different god than the Old Testament and the New Testament God. Because the God of the Bible would have had him stoned for this type of thing if you're going from the Old Testament. Right. Uh, but this God in the, you know, of Islam to say, oh, well, so the devil gets a little thing in here now and then. I'll fix it later. Right. You know, he, uh, the Allah God is kind of a, a theological fix-it man mm -hmm. with the devil. When the biblical God is straightforward and the truth is a truth and a prophet of God does not speak lies from the devil and then turn around later and say, oh, well, I made a mistake here and we're going to fix it. Right. So, I mean, that's a big difference between Islam, 
which I've referred to before in this series as a religion of unbelief, Islam, because it is an alien religion to Christianity, mm-hmm. uh, simply does not believe what Christianity and the Lord Jesus Christ teaches. Mm-hmm. It's a religion built on disbelieving what Christianity teaches. And that's why Christians, in a previous show we did, are attacked, the churches are burned, Bibles yeah. are burned, all these kinds of things happen against Christians. And it's because Islam does have a different God than Christianity has. And of course their prophet is a prophet who can speak for the devil, whereas Christianity's uh, prophet, Jesus Christ, is God himself and he doesn't make any mistakes and the devil can't touch him. Right. I mean, Big differences. Okay, well, anyway, brother, let's go on. What, what about changes in the Quran after Muhammad's time? Okay, well, after, after Muhammad died, uh, Bukhari, volume 6, number 509, says that when some other people died, they were the only ones who had memorized uh, certain verses in the Quran, and that information was lost. Okay. And other Bukhari hadiths that said that parts of the Quran were missing or abrogated are also uh, volume 4, 57, and 62, 69, and 229, and volume 6, uh, numbers 510 and 511. Okay. Now, Bukhari 6, uh, volume 6, 525 and 526 says that in the time of the prophet, which may not necessarily mean before his death, but certainly either then or immediately after, four people collected the Quran. And these people, and we'll learn a little bit more about one of them later, are Ubay, Mu'ad, Zaid bin Tabit, and Abu Zaid. And I have to apologize to Arabic-speaking people for my pronunciation, but um, uh, but 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 these but these four people collected the Quran. And there's no dispute there because this has come from the Al Bukhari Hadith, right? Which are Islamic sources, right? So. This is once again an information you're not making up. It's right. just right there in the hadiths, which they, are behind you. Yeah, and these are author- authoritative by Sunni Muslims. Exactly. Okay, uh, well, it seems though, of all these guys collecting this stuff, as you just mentioned, there seems to be one guy that really had an impact on the Quran as we now know it today. And that would be the Uthman, who you right. already uh, mentioned. Right. So and let's find out more about him. All right, Uthman, sometimes pronounced Uthman, uh, he was a uh, caliph. And he uh, basically, where was he in Saudi Arabia? Or? Uh, yeah, in 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 in. Well, I mean, the, the caliphs they would they could be in Mecca, but they also spent a lot of time leading armies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in, in Bukhari, Volume One, uh, sixty three, Annas relates, Uthman got the Quran compiled. Sounds like a programmer, but anyway, mm-hmm. Uthman got the Quran compiled and sent a few of its copies to far off places. Bukhari, Volume Seven, I'm sorry, Volume Four, Seven O Nine says Uthman dot 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 wrote the manuscripts of the Holy Quran in the form of a book. Now it's not saying that Uthman made the whole Quran up, but it's saying that he was one who wrote it down in book form. Okay, and a couple examples that Ubay had a number of surahs in his Quran that Uthman omitted from the standardized text, and Muslims do not read today. Okay, there was a Mecca named Abdullah Sar. She once made suggestions to Muhammad, and I'm sorry, he once made suggestions, and he later renounced Islam, and he was killed. Maybe he knew too much about how Muhammad, you know, wrote the different surahs. But anyway, even though Uthman made all these copies, um, he just ordered all the other copies of the Quran destroyed so he could hide his, his track. So it's sort of like somebody taking, let's say, a, a, a manuscript of the Bible and saying, well, I'm going to do better so that no one will ever know if there are any manuscript variations. I'm going to burn all the other copies. Well, he had, he, he had armies. He had power. Right. He was uh, in authority. The so number he one had, man in Islam. Yeah. Right. So he had the uh, authority to go run around and, 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 and destroy the other copies that had been collected or, or assembled of the the Quran right and so he uses his power to say well my copy is the one that counts it'd right. be like in the modern day context we've got Jehovah's Witnesses who came out with their own translation of the Bible in 1950 mm-hmm. and then they say well all the other Bibles don't count ours right. is the one that counts so we're gonna we want everybody to burn their Bibles and, and order a Watchtower Bible and Tract Society Bible from us well this is sort of the same thing here's here's a guy who gets a standardized ver- version mm-hmm. and then once all the other copies uh, destroyed but uh, you mentioned just for reiteration mentioned the hadith uh, about Uthman that's mentioned right in the, the Al-Bukhari in, in volume 163 and uh, the, uh, volume 4 709 mm-hmm. these these references here to him and then all this is substantiated by Islamic sources I want right. to keep 
pounding that point that mm -hmm. this is not something we're making up. This is this is what really happened, and this is how you got your Quran today. This book right here, of course, I got a Yusuf Ali edition, yeah. but he is still dependent on uh, Uthman to get his translation in English. Uh, from uh, uh, almost. We, almost. We, okay. We, we, we'll get to a few changes after Uthman. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> now, we want to we want to find out what happened to end up with this. Right. Okay. Uh, 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 all right. And and so uh, and another thing is that even though Uthman ordered all the other copies destroyed, um, some did survive. And, and they're actually there in the, in the uh, Azhar Library in, in, in Cairo. And they show an, a, a number of, of different um, uh, variants. Now, before we get into some of the variants, then and today, uh, we, ha we have to ask, why did Uthman burn the other copies? Unless they were different. Therefore, they had to be different if he ordered them burnt. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if the Muslim goes around burning the Quran, burning Qurans, he must think that they're different Qurans. Okay? Mm -hmm. Why did he need to standardize it? Unless you know, there was a need, okay, why did he threaten death to Muslims if they refused to use his Quran? Okay, uh, and why was it that some rejected Uthman's text? Okay, and he had to do it because there was differences. That there, there there wasn't just one text. Now we've been talking mainly about uh, Sunni Muslims. Now Shiite Muslims have a little different take on this. Uh, Shiite Muslims, some of them are are more willing to say, well, yes, the the, the Quran isn't completely accurate, uh, and they say Uthman did. Uh, a job on the Quran, basically, and I've heard some say it, as much as 25% of the original verses they claim were taken out of the Quran uh, for political reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if it's the highest 25% or not. That's just a claim that, I, that, that, that I've heard. So, what I'm saying is that the, the Sunnis are very likely to say, oh, the Quran has been unchanged, you know, ever since Muhammad originally wrote it, but Shiites might, you know, say a little bit different. So, what you're saying, basically, is there? there's a, I've heard that that legend before from uh, my Muslim friends that there was like uh, tables in heaven right. and sent down and it was just transmitted straight from Allah's table up in heaven down to the earth and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But what we're seeing based on Islamic sources themselves, this is not true at all. And there's there's problems. They they were believing even during Muhammad's day, you could speak for the devil. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Islam said, yeah. but then they're taking out things, putting back things. That now they're burning Qurans because this Quran doesn't say the same thing as that Quran. And there's all this confusion. Mm -hmm. But you don't get that when you're looking at the Old and New Testaments. Right. But you do get all this with the Quran. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk more about the New and uh, Old Testaments after a while. But uh, I just want to point that out to our viewers. This is Islamic sources saying this, that Muhammad could speak for the devil. He, Satan could touch him. They, they, they take in, take verses in, take verses out. They have different tra uh, variations of the Quran. They burn some. Some are still around, and we can compare. Uh, you talk about a mess. And then the Muslims complain about the Bible, which has far more evidence going for it than this. Just want you to think about that. Anyway, mm -hmm. Go ahead, bro. Uh, all right. Well, the Muslim may wonder at this point, well, what are some examples of some of these changes? Well, for, uh, for example, the people at, at, uh, at Kufa, uh, they used a, a Quran prepared by Abdullah ibn Masud, who, who was a, a, a companion of, of Muhammad. And Uthman forced them to use the, the Uthmanized Quran. And anyway, the Quran that they have, it did not even have Surahs 1, Surahs 113, and Surahs 114. And, uh, and, and, and uh, according to uh, uh, a doc something I have, it says that uh, Je uh, Jeffrey has a collection of the Quran, and he has 89 pages of variations. Okay. Now, uh, to, to give just an example, uh, there was a codex of Ibn Abbas, and the one, one, in one translation, I'm not one translation, an English translation, uh, in one place it says, O oh Allah, we seek your help and ask your forgiveness, and we praise you and do not disbelieve in you. We separate from and leave those who sin against you. Okay, this is from, all right, now in another place it says, O Allah, we worship you, and to you we pray and prostrate, and we run to and hasten to serve you. We hope for your mercy, and we fear your punishment. Your punishment will certainly reach the unbelievers. Okay, so do you um, run, do they run and hasten to serve Allah in the second one, or do we praise you and do not disbelieve you? Um, that's pretty different meaning there. Okay, and... Um, 
it, it, uh, it's also surprising, according to the source that I have, um, which you could see um, your, uh, yourself, it, it's on the answering.islam.org website, that even in Yusuf Ali's translation of the Holy Quran, he used a variant reading in, in Ubay's codex, Ubay bin Ka'b. And this is in, in, in Surah 33.6, where it would read, The prophet is closer to believers than to their own selves. This is a part that's different. And he is a father to them. And this is the end of the difference. And his wives are their mothers. Okay? So, and al it also mentions that in the latest uh, issued version uh, from Saudi Arabia, they don't necessarily, don't necessarily have all that, the variations. But, so there are some variations in the Quran. Now, are they major variations? Well, the Satanic Verses is, but most of the other variations are not major, but they uh, are definitely differences to show that it was not an exact copy, uh, or if it was an exact copy, it's not an exact copy anymore. One more deletion, something that apparently was in the original Quran, but is not today, is in Sahih Muslim. It says, Abu Waqid al Laithi said, when the Messenger of Allah saw or received the revelation, we would come to him and he would teach us what he had revealed. I came to him and he said, it was suddenly communicated to me one day. Verily Allah says, we sent down wealth to maintain prayer and deeds of charity. And if the son of Adam had a valley, he would leave it in search for another like it. And if he got another like it, he would press on for a third. And nothing would satisfy the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. Yet Allah is relenting toward those who relent. And this is from Az Suyuti. It's Al Itkan, I T Q A N, Fi uh, Ulum Al Quran, uh, page 525. And the point of this is saying is talking about the greed of people. But you look in the Quran today, it's not there. I mean, uh, I've, I've read the entire Quran and, and I don't recall anything like this. And according to this, it was in the original, according to the Sahih Muslim, which is one of the four uh, uh, authoritative hadiths, and it's not there today. Right. So another abrogated verse, obviously, right. from the Islamic sources itself. Now, uh, talking about the Quran today, you know. Okay. Let's, let's find out something about the Bible, the, the Quran Bible, <laughs> okay. a, the Bible of Islam, you might say. All right. They're definitely not the, uh, the Old and New Testament Bible, but uh, what can you tell us about uh, what we have in our hands in this current century? All right, well, uh, the Quran that Sunni Muslims today, and we're talking Sunni Muslims, uh, I'm, I can't say that Shiite Muslims and other Muslims necessarily use the same, exact same Quran, but the one that Sunni Muslims use is based primarily on the Ibn Masud Codex, which is not identical with Uthman's work. Uh, in the book Answering Islam, uh, by uh, Salib and Norm Geisler on page 192, uh, he mentions that there are 150 differences in just Surah 2, and that includes complete sentences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know if the Quran was originally written down, we think con with only the consonants like the Old Testament, you say, oh, there's some differences just because you put different vowels in there, but not taking out complete sentences. Right, right. So that's major. That's major stuff right there. Right, right. Uh, uh, and just a few other things uh, in uh, in answering Islam on page 193, uh, it says in Surah 2848, should the word translate transliterated into English be S A H I R A N I versus S I H R A N I, which sounds like a, a, a vowel sort of thing. Uh, but then there there are some others um, that that talk about in Surah 3822. T-I-S-U-N versus T-I-S-A-T-U-N. Yeah, the people at home are seeing this on their screen, so at least uh, they can read at least what you're what you're trying to show. Right, and 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 I'll I'll leave it to uh, our our listeners to try to pronounce the others. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the the point is 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 that there are there are differences in the Quran. Are they major differences? Uh, for the most part, no. But uh, it is not exactly the same. Right. So uh, this. Uh, for the Muslims that throw stones at Christians saying their Bible's corrupt and all this kind of stuff, it's only because, at least I think the, 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 the normal Muslims really don't know the, this background that you're talking about. The mm -hmm. problems in the text, the historical background, uh, what the things that the, the Hadith mentioned, they're simply not aware of these things, but it's so easy for them to attack another religion and assume it's false because it, they already want to believe the Quran. So they'll say, all oh, the Bible's corrupt and everything, but they never stop and look at their own religion and analyze it. Maybe they were just raised in Islam. 
and oh my grand my dad was a Muslim and my grandfather was a Muslim and everybody's a Muslim so I'm gonna be a Muslim but is that really a good criteria for determining if something is true or not? Is that what God would want you? Would <laughs> right. want you I mean, are you just going to, oh, because my great dad, great granddaddy was a, a Muslim and everyone else was, I'm going to be one too. And so, because they must be right, they're true. I mean, I know I, I love my dad, but I've seen him make mistakes. And he could make a mistake in religion, perhaps. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it doesn't have to be just Muslims. It could be anybody. I mean, they can be growing up in any kind of religion. How do they know that religion's true unless they get into it and study it? What I'm saying is most of the Muslims out there haven't studied the origins of their own book, checked into the facts and the evidences. Even like, like Steve here, you've researched those hadiths and things. I would mm -hmm. venture to say most Muslims haven't read all those hadiths. And they don't know half the stuff you're even mentioning here that uh, talks how Muhammad could be tricked by the Satan and, and Satan could slip some things in and then it took Allah to come back and fix it up. And you know, and you don't get that in the Bible. You don't get these kinds of things. There's a major problem here. And a, and a major problem is with those out there who just think their religion's true, not based on any facts or evidence, but because of the cultural upbringing they had, or they just want it to be true. It's sort of like if I wanted to believe in the Greek gods of Zeus and Athena and all those people, you know, I could just want to believe it. And sooner or later, I could just believe it, whether there's any facts to substantiate it, uh, would be another thing. Well, see, that's the problem. People want to just believe it without checking into the facts. So uh, when you run into people like that, and I've run into lots of them, they want to say, well, this is the word of Allah, and it's true, and the Bible's full of errors. Well, see, already I already know yeah. that they haven't checked the facts. They haven't checked the, and they're already telling me they're ignorant, and they're simply believing it because they want to believe it. Okay, so if someone says, <laughs> says that the Quran is the word from Allah, you say, well, which Quran? You mean the original right. one from Muhammad, the one uh, with Uthman, or the modern one you're using that that the Sunni is used today? Right. Or is it the the Quran before they assembled, these four guys uh, collected everything uh, that when it was still written on bones and tree bark and and, and still had the satanic verses in it? I mean, mm -hmm. is it would, would it be that Quran? Of course, that'd be kind of a almost <laughs> look like a garage sale if you finally gathered all that stuff together. Yeah. You get all <laughs> the parchments and the bones and stuff that had little verses written on. But uh, you see, there's a real problem here. And all I'm trying to say is before you go around attacking someone else's religion, you ought to check into your own backyard first mm -hmm. and see what you got going. Because what it usually comes down to is you just, people just, they just want to believe what they want to believe no matter what the facts say. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is already made up. You know, and that's what we're what we're basically dealing with. Yeah, but, but I, I should say, in, in fairness, that that's not limited to Muslims. There are exactly. other people of other religions that, that have that. And too. I mentioned that a moment ago. It's not just mentioned to Muslims. I mean, there's all kinds of religious groups, pseudo Christian groups. There's just most people seem to be like that. Yeah. And I'm just saying, if people would just stop and take God seriously, and if there is a God. And he is worthy to be researched by you. He has given us all a brain to utilize. The facts and everything are here. Uh, the Bible says, you know, you know, you can tell from creation itself. In Romans 1, there's a God. <laughs> and so if there is a God and he's got a message for us, then we should be able to find it. And you've got a mind to use. But most people don't want to use it. They just want to close their mind and just go along with, well, great granddaddy believed this, so I'm going to believe it too. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's uh, move on before I preach the rest of the show away. <laughs> I, 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 well, we, uh, when Muslims turn around and ask us about, well, what about the reliability of the Old Testament, or what about the reliability of, of, of the New Testament, rather than us just folding our hands and saying, well, that makes me very mad, or, or I don't want to discuss it. Uh, it's a fair question, and it is something that, that should be discussed, and it's something mm -hmm. that Christians should look into, and not just when asked by Muslims, but, to, yeah. but just in, in general. So uh, we don't have much time, but we want to give a brief answer to that right now. Okay, for the transmitted reliability of the Old Testament, all right, first of all, I need to mention, I guess, uh, we've already mentioned about what God has said about preserving His Word in Isaiah, but He's also said things in 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, and Matthew 24 and 35, and I'll leave it to the reader to look yeah, those up. In fact, up. in our previous shows, we've covered some of this material in more detail. We're just a little pressed for time here, yeah. but, uh, but, but get the whole series, you'll get it all. Yeah, but, but 
uh, but Yusuf Ali, I should mention, as far as the Old Testament, um, he says that the earliest copies of the Old Testament that we have are, he, he gives a date sometime after 900 AD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Yusuf Ali, that I don't know how old that was he put, but that is misinformation. Right. All right. That is the oldest date that we have for what's called the Masoretic uh, text of the Old Testament. All right. For a long time now, we've known about the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's like, well, if you throw stones at the Bible, you, you might what might come back might be the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, what happened is in 1947, uh, uh, a boy named uh, Muhammad Adib he threw some stones into this cave in the Qumran area, and he heard a crash, which seems kind of strange. So you don't hear a crash when you hit a rock against rock. So he threw another one in and it crashed. And anyway, what eventually happened is he found 11, uh, people found 11 caves that had over 500 Bible manuscripts in them, Old Testament Bible manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, 500 manuscripts and a fourth to a third of them were from the Bible. Okay. Now the people lived in Qumran up until about 68 AD when the Romans very abruptly came in and killed everybody when they were reconquering Palestine. So we know that there wasn't anything after that. We can also date them with you know, radiocarbon dating uh, back to the time of Christ. Um, and looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's like we don't have a copy of Genesis uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have 15 uh, almost complete or almost complete copies of Genesis and five, you know, at least 20 fragments beyond that. Okay. In the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. It, just in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and, and then the next. And is, scientifically, you can verify that it was way back at this time period. Scientifically, you can, and historically, you can, because we know the Romans wiped out everybody, and they hid this, these in caves before the Romans. So came. when a Muslim says, "Well, the Bible's been corrupted and it's been changed and everything," here we've got these examples you're bringing up that can be verified scientifically and historically right. for anyone to see. Right. And, and, and we have copies of Exodus, you know, 15 complete copies and 23 additional fragments. And the earliest copy we have of Exodus uh, has been dated to about 250 B.C. So, and not, not only did they have Old Testament manuscripts, they had commentaries on the Old Testament, too. And so with this vast wealth of material, we have a very good idea of the Old Testament that Jesus saw. Uh, people hear the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they also forget that we have other manuscripts, too. Uh, we don't have... Uh, the wealth that we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we have the Nash Papyrus, which is dated at 150 BC, and it contains the Ten Commandments. Okay, uh, we also have at Masada, you know, where the Jews held out at the end until the Romans finally came. There was a copy of Joshua. Okay, and mass spectrometer radiocarbon dating dated it to 169 uh, to 193 BC, somewhere in that time range. And Naho Heber is a cave near En Gedi, um, a little farther south, and it has a fragment of the Minor Prophets written in Greek. Um, and it was written sometime between 50 BC and 50 AD, and it was hidden during the Bar Kokhba revolt against Rome. Okay, and it is interesting because it's like a revision of the Septuagint, and it's almost identical to the Masoretic text. Okay, except in Greek. All right, and the Wadi Murabat scroll of the Minor Prophets is from the second century A.D., a little bit after Jesus, you know, uh, and, and you know, 100, 200 A.D., and it contains uh, parts of Habakkuk. Okay, well, the Yusuf Ali on the New Testament, he claims that the gospel today is not the angel mentioned in the Quran. He says the angel was the original gospel, but it's not that. Well, see, they, he has to say that because what we have in the Bible... The New Testament, Old Testament, is not what the Quran agrees with. Yeah. In fact, the Quran denies it in in totality as far as the essence of what the gospel is, who Jesus is, and things like that. And so naturally, he's got to say that to defend his own religion. Wait, 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 wait. Well, you would think so. But then another Quranic uh, commentator, Fazur Rahman, uh, contradicts Yusuf Ali and says, no, it is the same. At least the gospels are, are, are essentially the same. All right. And Jesus did teach the gospel according to Surah 348, and Christians, at least in Muhammad's time, were people of the gospel in Surah 546. Okay, but finally, I think the strongest argument is Muhammad's wife, uh, most perhaps most beloved wife, Aisha. In Bukhari, uh, volume 4, 605, she contradicts Yusuf Ali <laughs> indirectly by she says that, that Khadija, uh, you know, Muhammad's first wife, he took Muhammad to a Christian convert who used to read the Gospels in Arabic. Woo! Now, now let's, let's take this in for a moment. This is, this is to me, it hit me like a, slant, uh, a sledgehammer when you're giving all of this because mm -hmm. I am so used to Muslim apologists you know, like Yusuf Ali and and uh, this Malik guy I heard in a debate with James White not long ago, and and then of course 
you know, Dr. Jamal Badawi, I have his Islamic teachings right here, I've mentioned before in this series. He's a, I, I like him personally, don't get me wrong. But uh, anyway, I'm so used to the Muslim apologists saying, well, the Bible's been corrupted, changed, and that versus this and the other. Now, what you have just said is you're saying there's another Muslim guy that says Yusuf Ali is wrong. This is the same gospel message that we have today in the Bible. Well, yeah, I'm not sure if he mentions Yusuf Ali by name, but he, but he, but he says that what Yusuf Ali claimed is wrong, that, that it is the same. Okay, so that's from another Muslim scholar. Right. And, uh, and then, but the, but the kicker is coming from Islamic sources itself, the Hadith. Muhammad's wife, as recorded in the Hadith. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's an Islamic source. Right. It's considered authoritative. And uh, I think Muhammad's wife, Aisha, is considered authoritative. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I mean, certainly she knew a thing or two about Muhammad. I think that's pretty safe. So I think it'd be safer to believe her because she's closer to the events than to believe all these Muslim, Muslim apologists are telling us, oh, the Bible's all messed up and changed, and you can't believe it 2,000 years later. Right. So we're getting it right from Islamic sources that it is the same, mm -hmm. and it's what we got today. And right. what we have today is not the same as what the Quran is saying. All right, right. And of course, Aisha didn't understand that at the time, I'm pretty sure. If she knew everything like Dr. Badawi knows, mm -hmm. She would probably be saying the same thing yeah. Battery would be saying, but uh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm just, I, I love this because this just proves from Islamic sources that these Muslim apologists cannot go around saying this kind of stuff. Right. Because not only is a manuscript evidence that you just went through Dead Sea Scrolls and stuff, but now we get it from Quranic so or uh, Hadithic so sources themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, so so what we've done is that we've established um, that that the that the Old Testament was reliable in Jesus' time, and we have copies of the Old Testament from Jesus' time. All right. We've established that the Christians had the gospel today, had the gospel in Muhammad's time. Okay. We have not yet established though that we have the same gospel that they had in Muhammad's time, or we even had it back, you know, to almost Jesus' time. And we need to do that on the, okay. ne on the next slide. Okay. The, there it is. The, the earliest manuscripts of the gospel is that we have a, a part, a small part of the gospel of Luke from about 100 A.D. And we have the John Ryland's manuscript of the gospel of John, and it's roughly, uh, I've heard 125 A.D., maybe 127 to 130 A.D. We have the Chester Beatty papyri, which is uh, maybe 150 to 225 A.D. There are slightly different dates that people give. There's the Bodmer II, which is also called Papyri 66, about 200 A.D. I could go on with a long, long list, but we have about th 30 more before 30 A.D., eight around, um, uh, 30 more before 300 A.D., excuse me, uh, eight around 300 A.D., and we have a total of about 10,000 manuscripts and about 14,000 other manuscripts. That And the other manuscripts, they may not be the best for finding exact Greek tenses because they aren't Greek, but they do show that even in far off countries, like in Armenia and Georgia, that's not Georgia and the United States, that's Georgia and the former Soviet Union, uh, they had copies that way out there that, that, that agree with the text, and that's Ethiopic right. and, and other places. So There's we have plenty of evidence, just adding all this up, that's 24,000 manuscripts right, right there. Not, not even talking about all these other ones that we have. Right. We go way back showing Yusuf Ali is, the information is bad not only from historical reference, but from his own Islamic sources. Yeah, and, and, and it's like, so, uh, so are there any manuscript variations in the Bible? Uh, yes, we agree that there are manuscript variations. Uh, on the New Testament, we are uh, pretty much certain of about 97% to 97.5% of all the words. Uh, the others do not affect Christian doctrine. But our view of the, um, I guess, inspiration of the Bible is different than most Muslims view of the inspiration of the Quran. We believe that the meaning of the Bible is important and the meaning has been preserved without error. Uh, without you know through the ages it's been it's been given inerrantly and preserved infallibly while many Muslims say that the Quran word for word you know syllable for syllable um, has been preserved without any changes and so their assertion of that is wrong so they might want to ask well what else might have they been told that's wrong right uh, uh, and then this is very important we've mentioned this in other shows but we got one more chart here early church fathers right all right 
Uh, what if we didn't have the Bible manuscripts, just hypothetically speaking? Well, we have the early Christian church, and one of the, and they wrote a lot. And one of the things that they loved to do was to quote scripture. And in fact, uh, Sir David Dalrymple once calculated that the, the early church fathers from 97 to 325 A.D. referred to every single verse in the Bible, and except around 11. And some of the verses you could maybe say well was this really an inference or not so it never might jump up to you know 17 or so but except for a very few number of verses uh, they refer to, to every verse in the Bible and these are our are, 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 uh, church fathers that, that, that uh, like Irenaeus like Ignatius like uh, Cle uh, uh, Clement of, of Rome uh, even had an implication on a verse in Hebrews which is one of the later books Clement of Alexandria he had tons and tons of verses um, Tatian wrote a harmony of the Gospels uh, Unfortunately, later he he left Christianity, became a heretic. But uh, but we have his works. So even from a, a non-Christian source, he left out the stuff that showed the humanity of Jesus. So he left out the genealogies and things like that. But everything else is pretty much word for word, and uh, and it's so close that people say it's really not all that useful because um, there aren't that many interesting variations. And of course, even with the heretic leaving out stuff, he had so many things that were, that even a Muslim apologist today or someone. Who wouldn't believe the Bible? He would have verses in there they wouldn't agree with. Where you know talking oh, about oh definitely tons, tons. And, yeah especially yeah. since he left out the humanity part and left in the deity part right exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no well, Muslim well, that, well, they kind of do the op Muslim kind of do the opposite yeah exactly so uh, I guess what's happening here is when you look at the evidence you know the problem is in most religious discussions people are simply ignorant of their religious background where they haven't studied their own religion enough, let alone study the other guy's religion, and they're fearful. They think, well, I've always believed this all my life, and, and, and of course I don't study that much, and I spend more time uh, watching soccer on TV or something, but uh, uh, I want to believe this no matter what these other guys say, and they don't really research into the truthfulness of things, and that's what we're trying to get to. Look, if you are wrong on this, and there really is a God who's given us a message for mankind to know, and we believe it's the Word of God, the Bible, mm -hmm. and through His Son, Jesus Christ, we believe that's the truth, you could be facing the, the, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Uh, and that goes back to the original question we asked in this series. Can believing the Muslim religion send someone to hell? What is your answer, Steve? Uh, yes, again, if, if, they, if, if they believe uh, what Allah has not said and, they, and what the true God, you know, true Allah has not said, and they, and they deny what he has said. That's right. Remember, what we establish here, the Islamic sources say Muhammad could be deceived by the devil. He could be bewitched. He could be bewitched. It's in the Hadith. We've given all the information, but Jesus couldn't be touched by the devil. And that's biblical, and that's also from the uh, the Islamic sources it say is, he yeah. couldn't be touched by the devil. So why not believe Jesus rather than Muhammad, who could make mistakes and be bewitched by the devil? I mean, it only makes so much sense. Well, we're out of time. We have to go right now. For anybody that's interested, please call or write our ministry. We have uh, free newsletters we can send you, our resource list. We have tracks and other information on Islam if you're interested in that. Please call or write us. The phone numbers and address are at the end of the show. I'm Larry Wessels uh, with my esteemed colleague, uh, Steve Morrison. Uh, we're both of Christian Answers, Steve being our director of research. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. Trust in him, and thou shalt be saved. Thank you for being with us. Join us again next time. God bless you all. Listen now to Dr. James White in a recent debate he had with a Muslim apologist explain the problem in Islamic thought. Tremendously clear that to make the claim that they do, Islamic representatives must ignore the context of the New Testament itself, skip past the plethora of passages that teach the truth they do not believe, and most importantly, I believe, allow external authorities such as the Quran and their own beliefs to overthrow the plain testimony of Scripture. Indeed, this is admitted by one Islamic writer who honestly said, quoting, speaking of the New Testament, quote, it is absolutely impossible to get at the truth, the true religion, from these Gospels unless they are read and examined from an Islamic and Unitarian point of view, end quote. That's Dawood, by the way. In other words, unless you assume the falsity of Christianity, ignore the context of the New Testament, and instead insert what you seek to prove, you'll never find the true religion in the New Testament.
But of course, that's circular argumentation. And that's the problem. Muslims simply do not believe Jesus, his disciples, or Christ's scripture testimony, and therefore end up believing only what they want to believe, and thus deny Christ and his gospel. The consequence, then, is found in 2 Thessalonians, which states, And to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Muslim friend, please do not make this eternal mistake, but believe what Jesus said and not what Muhammad said, for Islam is a religion of unbelief and of making an idol of Muhammad a man who denied what Christ said. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 